Good morning. Welcome productive, patriotic taxpayers, and a separate welcome for our other guests, those distinguished lawmakers and parliamentary staff who clearly got lost on their way to Bellamy's. But fear not, because we are indeed here for a booth of a different kind. At the fifth annual Jonesy Waste Awards, pork is on the menu as we devour a degustation of disastrous waste, egregious government graft, and squandered taxpayer bacon. My name is Callum Purvis, Campaigns Manager at the Taxpayers Union, and along with our grassroots coordinator, Annabel Fleming, and our elegant emotional support mascot, Porky the Waste Hater, often seen on the front page of the Dominion Post, we are your hosts. Before I begin, I would like to thank Simeon Brown MP and the new speaker who have kindly hosted and approved us here at Parliament today. It is fantastic to be here in the beehive, the belly of the voraciously hungry government beast, to induct the past year's most spectacular feats of wasteful spending and bureaucratic buffoonery into our esteemed history books. Rest assured, though, this is at least one event your taxes haven't paid for. From Shane Jones's taxpayer-funded movie nights to the Department of Conservation's infamous funeral for a sea turtle, each year at these awards, we highlight the most absurd and outrageous ways Wellington has frittered away your hard-earned taxes. Our carefully chosen panel of experts have sorted through the disinformation, misinformation, and even malinformation, verified and screened nominations for conflicts of interest, and triple-checked to ensure that the Prime Minister has no cause to utterly reject the premise of our awards. Today, we will award a golden pig, each for waste at the local, central government levels, along with our big pig, the most horrendous hog for our lifetime achiever in government waste. So, Annabelle, why don't you step up to the podium of truth and tell us who made the shortlist for the local government category? Well, Cullum, we have a spectacular lineup of exorbitant local government spenders to acknowledge this year. Our first official nomination in the local government category is Auckland Council for Excellence in Trough Management. Auckland Council might just be the pinnacle of public prodigality and pencil pushing, with 3,002 staff earning, sorry, being paid, more than $100,000. Eke Panuku, for example, is Auckland Council's property management arm, but it turns out that what Eke Panuku actually specialises in is people management. The council-controlled organisation employs 203 staff, 50 of whom are managers. Nine are corporate executives paid over $200,000, while the other 41 lower-tier managers earn an average of $143,000 each. Are they worth more than twice the average Aucklander? Along with the excessive comes the downright ridiculous. The council recently advertised for a change manager to lead a team of just two people. The $140,000 per year salary to develop a communication strategy makes you wonder what the other 68 marketing and communication staff do all day. While failing to get things done, the Super City Council is spending millions on trying to make themselves look good, and they can't even get that right. Some bureaucrats might be worried about the promised job cuts under the new mayor. They need not be worried if the past year is anything to go by, where more than $1.3 million was paid out in severance payments to leaving staff members. It seems that in Auckland, the council gravy train is more reliable than the train to work. Our second nomination is Wellington City Council for paying to preach climate action. In a peculiar mix-up from the Wellington City Council, profits were confused with profits of another kind when they decided to give $20,000 to a local church. Someone paid rates for nearly seven years so that Eco Church New Zealand could understand their carbon footprint and develop climate action plans. We don't know what sins the good people of Wellington could have committed to deserve this, but we can only pray that the newly elected council will repent for this cavalier climate codswallop. 
Upon further investigation, we discovered that Eco Church also receives funding from both Auckland and Christchurch councils, a truly unholy trinity of council waste. <laughs> the third in the local government category is Wellington City Council's half million dollar roundabout. Originally intended to cost $200,000, this project went 185% over budget with a final cost of $570,000. The roundabout way in which this project was delivered put style before suitability, and we ended up with neither. Just three months after the circular spending was completed, the mosaic Tanifa centerpiece was no longer recognizable as the bespoke artwork it once was. A spokesperson for the council said there were a few minor teething problems with the artwork. Buses driving directly over the roundabout have left black scuff marks that are more visible than the artwork itself. <laughs> Meanwhile, bus users have complained about the jarring bump when mounting the roundabout, and pedestrians have complained about dangerous flow-on traffic problems at nearby crossings. The cost of this lavish loop equated to 203 years of rates for the average Wellington ratepayer, or three years' wages for our then mayor, who failed to foster a culture of sensible spending within the council. Fourth up, we have Tauranga City Council's credit card splurge on the back of a 15% rate hike. Tauranga bureaucrats have every incentive to waste ratepayer money, with the entire council unaccountable to voters after local government minister Nanaya Mahuta cancelled the city's elections earlier this year. The result was some particularly fishy spending. $188 on chocolate fish for the finance team left a bitter taste in the mouths of ratepayers who have just had to foot a 15% rate rise. Meanwhile, the chief executive wanted to get in on the action and opted for a fresh ratepayer-funded valet for his ratepayer-funded car. And rather than using space in one of the existing ratepayer-owned buildings, council bosses opted to host an executive team meeting at a local bar, racking up a tab of $796. And our final local nominee is Wellington City Council for a $130,000 spelling mistake. <laughs> the latest sculpture in the Windy City has blown us away with its sheer stupidity. The sculpture contains giant lettering spelling well Wellington without the I. The cost to ratepayers is far from finished, with the sign's current location only temporary. They're planning to relocate it to other parts of Wellington and repaint it each time it's moved. The council wants people to stand in the sculpture and post a photo on Instagram with the hashtag in Wellington. In the 10 months since installation, a staggering 44 people have done so. That is $3,000 per post. Wow. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, as a former councillor myself, it seems that the council chambers here in New Zealand are a lot more creative um, than those back in Scotland. All the nominations are worthy, but only one can take home the bacon. Porky. Thank you. And the winner of the Golden Piggy for the 2022 Jonesy for Waste and Local Government, if I can get the envelope open, is Well Ington City Council. With a, rec with a record of three nominations this year, this was an easy decision for our panel. The Capital Council's excessive expenditure and lack of sympathy for ratepayers shows just how out of touch they are with the rest of New Zealand. Congratulations to all of our local government nominees today. I would say try harder next year, but they really don't seem to need any encouragement. Back to you, Annabelle. Now we turn our attention to the incredible achievements of central government. Like a pair of ne'er-do-well nefs with a nicked credit card, Jacinda Ardern and her big spending sidekick Grant Robertson have led their cabinet through another year of superfluous spending, making it difficult to narrow down our shortlist. 
There's only space at the trough for five nominees, but it would be remiss not to give an honourable mention to the $55 million Public Interest Journalism Fund. Aside from undermining the last sliver of public faith in media independence, the fund delivered world-leading investigative journalism on the secret life of furries, people who take pleasure in dressing up in anthropomorphic animal costumes. But with that out of the way, we can now present our first official nomination in the central government category. Minister Damien O'Connor for a staffer's breakfast. What this nomination lacks in monetary value, it more than makes up for in intrigue. Deep within 55 pages of receipts for our trade minister's expenses was a bill for a mysterious breakfast at a five-star Boston hotel valued at over $100 for an unnamed staffer. While the minister dined downstairs for less than half the price, this official opted to order room service in the comfort of their $1,200 taxpayer-funded hotel room. According to the minister, it is frivolous, vexatious, or trivial to ask what food was ordered that explains the exorbitant price for this bureaucratic buffet. But we have some ideas. Looking at the menu, for $100, that hungry official may have ordered the full American breakfast, featuring two eggs, bacon, ham, sausage, fried potatoes, tea, coffee, and juice, plus the cinnamon brioche French toast, topped with maple syrup, berries, and sugar, while still having money left over for the tip. That brings a whole new meaning to a bloated public service. We had to wonder if it was in fact an exercise in diplomatic relations. A staffer treating a new friend to a romantic taxpayer funded breakfast in bed. We actually checked with the minister and received strong assurances that the staffer dined alone and the only tinder used that night was for the fire that sent taxpayer money up in flames. So, on to our second nomination, NZ On Air for another documentary on Chloe Schwarbrick. Green Party fanatics must have loved the previous taxpayer-funded hagiography so much that they are now getting a second one, Chloe Too. This time, the 90-minute documentary featuring Green MP Chloe Schwarbrick will cost you $220,000. The documentary is supposedly nonpartisan because the funding proposal cited, quote, Judith Collins publicly expressed admiration for Chloe as an example of her appeal across political lines. Sorry, Judith, but our fantastic taxpayer union career polling disagrees. The 2023 election result is envisioned by the producers as the logical conclusion to the film story arc. Tears will be shed. When your humble taxpayers' union exposed the cost of this film, NZ On Air quickly fired off a press release accusing us of misinformation for stating that they'd given the documentary $220,000. In reality, the documentary only received $219,999, $20,000 of which came from another bureaucracy, the Film Commission. For this egregious error, we can only apologize. And our third nomination for waste from the Beehive is the Ministry of Youth Development for Anime Propaganda. The Ministry of Youth Development signed a $300,000 contract to produce three one-minute anime videos that are designed to support young people to thrive by creating and raising an awareness of well-being. The first video shows a teenager Googling, what happens if I get COVID? before the world descends into dystopian chaos, only to return to normal after a cartoon Jacinda Ardern appears to reassure everyone. The videos were a flop, with the first episode receiving only 34 views on YouTube. <laughs> and most of those came from the Taxpayers Union research team watching incredulously. <laughs> When we questioned the value for money, the ministry claimed the campaign received over 70,000 views on TikTok. However, after enlisting a young intern, well-versed in the world of social media, we were unable to locate the video anywhere on the app. So we went back to the ministry and asked what their TikTok account was, and after months of delays in responding to the requests, they conceded they did not in fact have a TikTok account. 
This story came from our tip line after a supporter saw a strange billboard simply stating, what are you up to? We direct that question back to the ministry. Our fourth nomination is the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority for the ferry with the flat battery. East by West Ferries received $300,000 from the EECA to go towards buying an electric ferry. The money came from the Technology Demonstration Fund aimed at supporting the early adoption of proven technology within New Zealand. However, there is no fairy tale ending to this expenditure. As just two months ago, the ferry got a flat battery in the middle of Wellington Harbour and had to be rescued by a diesel-powered boat. Of course, even if the battery worked as intended, handouts for electric ferries won't actually reduce New Zealand's net carbon emissions, which are governed by the emissions trading scheme. The only thing this fund demonstrated was how to waste taxpayer money. And finally, for our final central government nominee, Waka Kotahi for the most expensive ribbon cutting ceremony. We had a shopping list of options to choose from for our transport agency, leading to a gruelling, single transferable vote style runoff for the worst spending from Waka Kotahi. It was hard to look past the $30,000 big red zeros for ministerial photo ops and the advertising of big spending council candidates during the local elections, but the opening ceremony for Transmission Gully takes the cake. We know politicians love a good ribbon cutting. Whether it's a project they never knew existed or one that was commissioned three governments ago, they'll show up for the photo op and the sausage rolls. Much like the entire project, the opening ceremony for Transmission Gully was a blowout. It cost the taxpayer $336,000. The bill included planning, marquees, chairs and tables, temporary fencing, catering, photography and video, audiovisual equipment, lighting, stages, provisions of electricity and buses for guests, all for a few politicians to pat themselves on the back for a project that was two years past deadline and $400 million over budget. When questioned about this extraordinary ceremony, Waka Kotahi's portfolio delivery manager, Mark McKenzie, justified the expense saying the cost of the opening event was included in the overall $1.25 billion budget. Well, that's okay then. Back to you, Cullum, to announce our winner. Thank you, Annabelle. After many working groups, hard work, consultation, working lunches, and the obligatory cultural impact assessments, our panel has finally come to a consensus on the winner of our central government category. Please put your trotters together for the winner of the Jonesy Award for Waste in Central Government. Waka Kotahi for the most expensive ribbon cutting ceremony. It is now time for the trophy trotter, the heinous ham, the most prestigious award for one lucky little porker to enter New Zealand's Hall of Fame for Government Waste, the Lifetime Achievement Award. Last year's recipient was our big spending finance minister, and you could rightly assume that he would be hard to top. But in 2022, we recognize a giant, the self-described Tane Mahuta of Government Waste, our winner today likens the financial system to a forest, which is fitting since he clearly thinks that money grows on trees. <laughs> Yesterday, Adrian Orr was reappointed as the governor of the Reserve Bank, the job he has completely failed at for a further five years. But today is the cherry on top for his illustrious career as he receives this great recognition for his achievements. It isn't the first time, however, that Mr. Orr has presided over rapid inflation. In 2017, his own $1 million salary as chief executive of the New Zealand Superannuation Fund made headlines when it was inflated by 36%. He had already received a 22% pay rise just two years prior. But public service is the trough that keeps on giving. In his current gig, Orr's job is to keep inflation down. 
naturally he will go down in the history books as presiding over a 30-year high. But what really earned Adrian Orr the attention of our esteemed judges is the great skill it takes to make a loss by literally printing money. Mr. Orr's large-scale asset purchase program saw the Reserve Bank buy $53.5 billion of New Zealand government bonds on the secondary market between March 2020 and July 2021. At the time, the Treasury boffins warned that Orr's program had the potential to suffer significant financial losses. The true cost of this gamble will not be known for a few more years, but the most recent figure from Adrian's mate, Grant Robertson, puts this, invested, this investment's expected loss at $8.46 billion. Yes, billion. That's $4,354 for each and every household in New Zealand. The Treasury Secretary has been authorised to spend up to $200 million a month indemnifying this behemoth blunder. Ask whether he stood by his decision to support Adrian's punt on the bond market. Fellow lifetime achiever Grant Robertson said he didn't have the luxury of hindsight. Well, it takes two to tango when it comes to tormenting taxpayers. Notwithstanding rising inflation and reckless money printing, Governor Adrian Orr has demonstrated astounding creativity and dedication in his personal mission to spend Reserve Bank time and resources on his personal pet causes such as climate change and storytelling. In fact, his latest statement of intent for the Reserve Bank referenced climate change 51 times, twice as many times as it referenced inflation. Perhaps his real expertise is in inflation of a different sort, it certainly takes an inflated ego to compare oneself to the Maori god of the forest, as Adrian did with the Reserve Bank's recent $100,000 rebrand and $6 million new website. So, it is with much reverence that we bestow upon this deity of the economy his greatest and most fitting honour yet, the 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award for Excellence in Government Waste. Put your hands together for Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr. The man who printed enough money to tear down a forest and who our great-grandchildren will remember as Tani Mahuta, the bloke whose debt we are still paying off. Adrian would have loved to accept this award in person today, but following yesterday's reappointment for another five-year term as Reserve Bank Governor, he is busy thinking of more ways to do anything except tackle inflation. To close today's proceedings, we would like to again thank you, the taxpayers, for all the hard yards you put into creating the wealth that politicians and officials waste on your behalf in their relentless pursuit of nominations in these awards. What would they do without you? This annual ceremony serves as a reminder to those who sign off on pig-headed expenses, large and small, that we are watching them. The Taxpayers' Union is growing at a rate of knots, and while we have fun at the Joneses, we take our role in holding government to account more seriously than ever. Annabelle, Porky and I will be sticking around for a few brief photographs, but until next year, thank you very much for coming and helping with these celebrations.